Before I begin, I feel the need to explain that my story is in no way a description of the vast majority of Muslim family life. And in fact, when people take the time to interact with one another, it doesn't take long to realize that we have a lot more in common than we do different. However, being raised in the home of a zealot, I've been exposed to many of the things that people fear about Islam. Yet I stand here promoting peace. This would be impossible in a world where we hang on to our old prejudices. I'm here to dispel some of the stereotypes that certain politicians and media pundits attempt to project into mainstream society. I feel that I can use my experiences to combat those who would take advantage of people's fears for their own ends. Because of political opportunists who use the more radical elements of Islam to generalize the beliefs of all Muslims, but also because of extremist groups themselves who believe that the lives of the innocent are fair game on the ideological battlefield, I am compelled to speak up. It's a foolish mistake to believe religious extremism is exclusive to Islam. Unfortunately, there are endless examples in every belief system of violence perpetuated by those who believe it. However, in every population, in, or rather, excuse me, in every religion and in every population, you will find a small percentage of people who hold so fervently to their beliefs that they feel they must use any means necessary to make others live as they do. When we ostracize entire communities for the actions of a few, it tears at the fabric of our society, and it only works to foment the next generation of intolerance. It may come as a surprise to some that although I was raised in the religion of Islam, I'm no longer a Muslim. This has little to do with my feelings on Islam in particular. In fact, I bring it up only to point out that I didn't leave Islam because of my father's actions. I knew that what he did was well outside of mainstream interpretation of the religion. And the only reason I really point it out is um, to say that I'm not here advocating for any particular religious belief. I'm simply here to share my story and lessons that I learned from them. Now having said that, I would like to illustrate the path that I was put on as a child by my father, who for most of my life has resided in maximum security prisons. This was a special Friday for me. I was a normal six-year-old staring at the chalkboard waiting for the three o'clock bell to ring so that I could escape from school. But that day, my father was waiting in the hallway early. He said, Salaam Alaikum, which means peace be upon you. And I replied, Wa Alaikum Salaam, and peace be upon you, the proper way for two Muslims to greet one another. He tells me that we're going to the mosque for a Friday prayer, where the blind Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman was to preach. As many of you know, millions of Muslims around the world gather in mosques on Fridays to listen to sermons given by Sheikhs. In Islam, it is said that praying in a group brings you more blessings than praying alone, which makes Friday prayer the most blessed prayer of the week. When we arrived at the mosque, <clears throat> I sat down and I tried my best to mimic my father as he listened intently to the sheikh's words. Now on these Fridays, clerics all over the world <clears throat> share many different messages. The vast majority of them express a world where we can all live together as co-inhabitants in peace. The blind sheikh was not one of those men. He sat at the front of the worshippers with a microphone attached to his collar. And as he began his khutbah, or his uh, sermon, I listened to stories that I had heard many times before. The sheikh spoke of groups that many televangelists, Christian televangelists in the United States blamed for 9-11, pagans, feminists, gays. But he saved his most venomous words for that of the nation of Israel. He spoke of interference 
and collusion by the United States and its Western allies to further their agenda at the expense of Muslim nations. And he used the, that support to foment the emotion of his congregation. He also spoke of the war in Afghanistan at the time and how the United States had used Muslims who had gone to Afghanistan from all over the world to fight against the Soviet Union as a military and economic strain and that once the Soviets fell, America discarded those fighters like trash on the side of the road. When he finished his sermon, my father took my hand and he led me toward the front. This wasn't the first time I had met the Sheikh. I had spent many nights either at the mosque or at one of my father's friends' houses or even in our own living room, sitting on the floor listening to the men discuss religion and politics. I realized it was always somewhat ominous, exchanging words with the sheikh after one of his sermons. And looking back, it was quite clear that he was still very wrapped in the passion and anger that he conveyed in his speech. <clears throat> On the drive home that afternoon, I wondered to myself what made the sheikh and his followers so intensely devout. I asked my father, when did you become such a good Muslim, confusing his zealotry for piety? And he said, when I came to America and saw everything that was wrong with it. And in that instant, I saw the same look of anger on his face that I had seen earlier on the sheikhs. Our family dynamic began to change soon after. It was during this time, at the height of the Afghan war, that I was forced to say goodbye to one of my best friends. He and his siblings were taken by their stepfather from a suburb in New Jersey to Pakistan to train and then eventually fight in Afghanistan. He was 10 years old at the time. Because of his inexperience, he was used to lob grenades at the enemy's occupying forces. And when he'd returned to America less than a year later, where once there stood a happy, vibrant child, now stood a solemn veteran of the Afghan war. He was a shadow of his former self. His innocence taken from him by a war he had no business being a part of. This is what happens when we use violence as a resolution of conflict. In a back and forth effort to gain even the slightest strategic advantage against one's enemies, man has gone to lengths that seem inconceivable to those who are sheltered from the negative effects of war. But make no mistake, humanity has shown that it's willing to exploit almost any resource, even the lives of children, all in the name of one ideology or another. Each time we resort to war, whether as a means of resolving conflict or for spreading some ill-conceived notion of freedom, we guarantee an escalation and desensitization of violence in our culture. The summer after I turned seven, my grandfather came from Egypt to America to visit my family. Little did he know my father had actually brought him to the US to try and convince him to take my family back to Egypt so that my father could go fight in Afghanistan. My grandfather's response to him was absolutely not. Your family is your responsibility. And he went so far as to say that he would disown my family if my father went to go fight in this war. He said, if you want to make jihad, stay here and take care of your family. And I bring that word up, jihad, because if you were to ask the average person, what do you think that word means? They may say that it's an act of terrorism or that it means holy war, but that is not the definition of jihad. In reality, jihad can be something as simple as providing for your family. It's only extremists and those who wish to generalize that reduce that word to a destructive act. My grandfather went back home thinking that he had won the argument with my father, but my father was left only frustrated and unwilling to find a nonviolent outlet for those frustrations. On November 5th, 1990, when I was seven years old, my father assassinated a man. That man was Rabbi Meir Kahana, the leader of the Jewish Defense League. 
The JDL, as it was called, was described by the United States government as the largest terrorist organization operating inside the United States at the time of his assassination. And it was quite strange to hear adults frame it as one extremist killing another, that there was some murder that is justifiable and some that is not. While attempting to flee the scene, my father was also shot by a federal postal officer and he and Meyer Kahana were rushed to Bellevue Hospital with similar gunshot wounds to the neck. Kahana died that night, but my father lived. Although he was initially acquitted of the murder while serving time on assault and weapons charges, my father began planning attacks on a dozen New York City landmarks, including tunnels, synagogues, and United Nations headquarters. Thankfully, those plans were foiled by an intelligence asset who infiltrated the group. <clears throat> Sadly, the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center was not. My father and the men that he was involved with would ultimately be convicted for their role in the plot. <clears throat> A few months prior to his arrest, my father sat me down and explained that for the past few weekends, he and some friends had been going to a shooting range on Long Island for target practice. And he said that I'd be going with him the next morning. And to be honest, I was so excited I could barely sleep that night. And my excitement once again began to mount the next morning when we got into the car. We arrived at Calverton's shooting range, which unbeknownst to our group was being watched by the FBI. My father and I walked towards the group of men huddled by the trunk of a car and inside were a range of weapons. When it was my turn to shoot, my father helped me hold a rifle to my shoulder and explained how to aim at a target about 30 yards off. I was so nervous, my palms are sweating. I gently squeezed the trigger and my ears rang and the noise echoed through the woods that surrounded the range and a small knot showed where the bullet had broken through the canvas. Hearing the praise from the men around me and with my father standing over my shoulder smiling, it was one of my proudest moments. My father seemed to be having almost as much fun as I was, if not more. Using a fully automatic weapon, he shot the legs out from under one of the larger targets, causing it to come crashing to the ground. And the men all shouted and had a laugh. The last one I shot hit the small orange light that sat on top of the target, and to everyone's surprise, especially mine, the light exploded. And as I stood there, not being sure if I was in trouble or not, my uncle turned to the other men and in Arabic said, Ibn Abu, like father, like son. And they all seemed to get a really big laugh out of that comment, but it wasn't until a few years later that I fully understood what they thought was so funny. They thought they saw in me the same destruction my father was capable of. Those men would eventually be convicted of placing a van filled with 1,500 pounds of explosives into the sublevel parking lot of the World Trade Center's North Tower, causing an explosion that killed six people and injured over 1,000 others. These were the men that I called Ammo, which means uncle. These were the men that I looked up to. It saddens me to think that had they not committed this crime, the innocent people killed in the attack would be at home spending time with their loved ones. Instead, their families were forced to live their lives without their guidance and companionship. I was seven years old when my father went to prison and there's not a day that goes by that I don't wish he had chosen a peaceful life with his family. Instead, he exposed me from a very young age to the intolerance and radical nature of extremism. And yet I stand before you all today with this simple message, that no matter the level of violence you've been exposed to, it doesn't have to define your character. That in all of us is the ability to change our paths. But it is not always possible for us to do it alone. 
and it often takes the work of those closest to us and even entire communities to help us <clears throat> to see a path beyond the trauma that this world can sometimes dole out. I spent years of my life visiting him in prisons. We would even spend entire weekends, three days and two nights, in a small home inside of the prison where my mother could cook meals and we could rent movies. My father would play baseball with us in the grass. And we got to pretend to be a family. I actually remember my first trip to visit him like it was yesterday. It was a dull gray morning. My family had gotten up extra early to make the trip into New York City. We arrived at the prison parking lot and there was this thick fog everywhere. And it was very clear even to a seven-year-old that this was going to be a strange day. A bus took us across a bridge to the main facility of Rikers Island where we were taken through security and patted down and then through metal detectors. And it was quite scary for a child. And then we were walked down a long hallway lined with cells that provided privacy for the families visiting inmates. A guard opened the door to one of the cells, <clears throat> and there stood my father in his orange jumpsuit. And he gave each one of us a hug, and then we sat down across from each other at the table. The first thing I noticed was the long surgical scar that ran across his chest and up his neck where the doctors had tried to remove the bullet that was lodged inside him. I remember the whole time trying not to stare at it. And while he and my mother sat in conversation and he declared his innocence to her, I sat wondering how his being in prison would affect our family life. That first trip was nerve wracking to say the least, but as the weeks turned into months, it became pretty routine to have to pass through armed guards and high walls in order to see my father. This went on for years, but eventually my mother remarried and we decided as a family to discontinue any further contact with my father. We also changed our names so as to hide our identity from the community in which we lived. It's certainly unusual when an American citizen admits to being the son of the first member of a bin Laden organization to shed blood on American soil. Shame for what my father had done and fear for how I would be judged for his actions had caused me to hide my identity from most of those who knew me. I realized at a young age I had to be careful who I told my life story to. People's reactions have ranged from nervous laughter and shock to outright anger and threats against my life. I even once sustained a wound across my hand as I tried grabbing a knife from someone I thought was a friend as he lunged at me, exclaiming, I'd be doing America a service if I killed you. Luckily, I was able to escape without any serious injury. By the time I turned 19, I had already moved 20 times in my life. And that instability during my childhood didn't really provide a lot of opportunities to make many friends. Each time I'd meet one or two people that I began to feel comfortable around, it was time to pack up and move to the next town. And being the perpetual new kid at school, I was frequently the target of bullies. So for the most part, I spent my time at home reading books and watching TV or playing video games. For those reasons, my social skills were lacking, to say the least. And growing up in a bigoted household, I wasn't prepared to interact with the real world. I'd been raised to judge people based on arbitrary measurements, like a person's race or religion or gender or sexuality. So what opened my eyes? One of the first experiences I had that challenged my way of thinking was during the 2000 presidential elections in the United States. Through a college prep program, I was able to take part in the National Youth Convention that was taking place in Philadelphia, where I lived at the time. Young people from all over the country were coming to the respective cities of the Republican and Democratic conventions, and they would hold these youth conventions for students, for young people to talk about the things that mattered to them. 
Having been the victim of bullying for much of my life, I joined a group talking about youth violence. It was something that I was very passionate about. A few days into the conference, I found out that one of the kids that I had become particularly close with was Jewish. Now, I had never had a Jewish friend before. And in fact, when I first found out, I actually felt a great sense of pride because I thought I had done something that no one had ever done before, um, which is, of course, ridiculous. But that is the way that living in an ideological bubble warps our perspective around reality, warps our emotions, this idea that I could feel pride founded solely in my own ignorance. Nevertheless, it was the first time in my life I thought perhaps what I had been taught wasn't true. Something else profound happened at that conference. I saw a young man, he was maybe in his mid-twenties, get up on stage, and he shared his life story. He talked about growing up poor, being raised by a single mother, and being bullied really badly. And it was the first time in my life that I thought there's someone else who might understand what I'd been through. And for years after that, when I went through a difficult period, I, I held on to his words that things didn't always have to be this way, that change is not only possible, but inevitable, and that our choices mattered. And they didn't just matter to us, that they mattered to the people closest to us and that they mattered to people on the other side of the world. But the most important lesson that I left with that day was that I wasn't alone. Sometimes I feel like um, I could hold a degree in loneliness <laughs> um, to feel even in a room full of people praising you for your courage, um, vying for your attention, to still feel alone. But that day was the first time that I ever thought, I'm not alone. I would ask you all to look at the people sitting next to you. What an incredibly diverse group of people we have here, sharing so many commonalities. And to know that you are not alone. When you go home, know that you are not alone there either. Seek out others like you and not like you. We may not all have the same experience, but you won't be surprised to find that many feel as you feel. Be willing to share the most vulnerable parts of yourself, if only to show others that it's okay to do the same. Be willing to listen when others make themselves vulnerable. And if you can't share right now, or you never feel that you can, that's okay too. Know that that's okay too. Take your time and love yourself. About a year after that conference, I moved to Florida and I got a summer job at Bush Gardens, an amusement park. And there I was exposed to people from all over the world, from so many different lifestyles and cultures, and it proved to be fundamental to the development of my character. As chance would have it, well, let me say that I was raised to believe that homosexuality was a sin, and that by extension, all gay people were evil. While working there, I had the opportunity to work with some of the gay performers at a show there, and I found that some were the kindest, least judgmental people I had ever met. I didn't know it when I was going through it, but being bullied as a kid created a sense of empathy in me toward the suffering of others, and it comes very unnaturally to me to treat people who are kind in any other way than how I would want to be treated. I had an interaction with a particular young man where I showed him 
at the very least, disdain for what I perceived as his choice. And in reaction to that hatred, he showed me kindness. And it was impossible for me to ignore that I was doing to him what had been done to me a thousand times before. I could feel the emotion by the look in his eyes that I had felt countless times. It was impossible for me to ignore my own hypocrisy, that I was the bully in that situation. And I can tell you, as sure as I am standing here today, that being bullied was the thing that had the longest lasting effect on my sense of self-worth, on my self-esteem, the value that I felt. But that day, I realized that I couldn't perpetuate that feeling that I had felt in others. I refused to. Being able to contrast the stereotypes I'd been taught as a child with real life experience and interaction forced me to confront my own hypocrisy. Not long after, I had a discussion with my mother about how my worldview was starting to change, and she said something to me that I will hold dear to my heart for as long as I live. She looked at me with the weary eyes of someone who'd experienced enough dogmatism to last a lifetime and said, I'm tired of hating people. And it sounds like such a simple statement, but it was so profound for me that I often fight back tears just thinking about it. It wasn't just that I could see the toll of dealing with the fallout of my father's actions for so many years had on my mother, dealing with um, the FBI and death threats and lawyers being ostracized everywhere she went. It was like she was giving me permission to go out into the world and experience people unencumbered by the prejudices that I'd been taught. And I will tell you that I would liken it to taking a pair of sunglasses off. The world was a brighter place. I didn't have to be so worried about the next person coming around the corner being my enemy. And in fact, I would argue that many, if not most, of the people who are indoctrinated into ideologies that preach hatred, if given the opportunity, would gladly reject it because of the amount of energy that it takes to, to be consumed with that hate and with that fear. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who had been indoctrinated into violent ideologies and they expressed you know, very similar sentiments, how draining it was to feel that every day. One of the interesting effects of being in the public eye is that if anyone wants to get in contact with me, I'm never more than a few clicks away. One day I woke up to find an email from the Bureau of Prisons saying that an inmate, my father, would like to begin communication with me. Now. The truth is, before I ever started speaking publicly, I had wanted to get back in contact with my father. I wanted to ask him why he chose the path he did. If he did it for his faith or for fame, did he feel an overwhelming need to be a part of something greater than himself? If so, why wasn't his family enough? I really wasn't sure if I was ready to hear the answers to these questions, but every part of me felt like I had to know. And I thought, what if he died in prison and I never got this opportunity? So I clicked yes. It had been maybe 13 years since I had been in contact with him. And our conversation started off nicely enough. He told me that he supported my work promoting peace. I told him about my family's life after he went to prison, about growing up poor, moving from ghetto to ghetto, being ostracized everywhere we went. It was important to me that he understand how hard it was for my family, particularly for my mother, who had to work so hard to keep a roof over our heads and to keep us together. 
When my father found out that I was no longer a Muslim, though, his tone began to change, and he became consumed with this one aspect of our conversation. And he essentially told me that all of the anxiety and the mental health issues that I was struggling with, my depression, would all go away if I just returned to Islam, which, as an atheist, I didn't find especially helpful. He even went so far as to question my intentions, saying that his lawyer told him I was stupid for asking him these questions. He was going through appeals at the time, and he thought that perhaps I was trying to implicate him in a crime so that I could ensure that he never got out of prison. And that in and of itself was a strange aspect of our conversation, this idea that my father, who was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences, may actually get out of prison right as I began communication with him. Uh, it was a, um, a strange idea, to put it lightly. To th say that this new chapter in our conversation was disheartening, again, would be an understatement. I stared at those last few emails, realizing that the answers that I had been searching for my entire life weren't there. And our conversation became really unhealthy, and so I decided once again to end communication with my father. And for months after that, really, I, I felt so down. I had put so much importance in the questions that I wanted to ask him and in the answers that he would give me. And one morning, I woke up, and I actually felt a sense of relief, and I wasn't initially sure why. But as the day progressed, it dawned on me that although not the answer that I was looking for, my father had actually given me exactly what I needed. His ideology led to an oversimplified worldview, one in which a person's race, religion, sexuality, gender, was all that was needed to determine a person's worth. And I realized that I didn't need his answers anymore. And in a sense, that set me free. One of the most incredible experiences I've gotten to have as a speaker was when I was invited to an organization called Tuesday's Children, which began as a support group for the families of victims of 9-11 and eventually grew into an organization that provided support for survivors and family members of people who had been killed by violence all over the world. And I'd never been so nervous to give a speech. I, I thought to myself, what could I say to this? They have a, um, a summer program called Project Common Bond. They bring hundreds of young people between the ages of 12 and 24 from all over the world together to spend a few weeks with each other during the summer just to interact. And I thought, what could I teach them? What lessons could I bestow upon them that would renew their faith in humanity? And it took me about five minutes of actually interacting with them to realize that I was the one that needed to be taught a lesson. These young people refused to allow the worst experiences of their lives to determine the trajectory that their life would take in a negative way. And not only that, but they wanted to use their experience to try and make sure that no one else ever had to go through what they went through. And I find that just incredible. It's easy to read the headlines, and to think that this world is beyond saving. But we can look to the example of these young people and to the countless people like them who have survived or who have to live with the loss of a loved one, who will feel more renewed than ever to try and make sure that no one else has to face what they have faced. I'd like to end with one very recent example of interaction. Um, on the flight over here, actually, we had to make an emergency landing because a woman gave birth to a child on board. Um, yeah. And I slept through the whole thing. But, <laughs> um, which is crazy because she was 15 feet behind me. But um, we were sat on the tarmac for about two, and two hours, two and a half hours, and 
what at first, you know, during the flight, the, the, the cabin was very quiet. But as time went on, uh, you could hear all of these conversations taking place with complete strangers, some of whom didn't even speak the same languages. And I just thought to myself, how beautiful is this, that this one little experience was enough to create a dialogue amongst a whole bunch of people who would have been perfectly content with just sitting and not talking to each other for the rest of the flight. And, you know, in my life, I, I've always tried to find, I, I've always been a very curious person, I've always tried to find the lessons in life. And this was just a beautiful example of how interaction can, can create communication among people. People often People often ask me if there was a specific moment that I decided to reject my father's beliefs. And the truth is there were a thousand tiny little experiences that brought me along this path, both good and bad. Trying to take the best <laughs> from sometimes the worst. As I mature, I realize that the only way we can overcome the challenges of our past, which at times can be crippling, is to help others understand that hatred only produces more hate, but belief in nonviolence at least provides an opportunity to heal. That those cycles of violence, no matter how old, don't have to continue forever. I am not my father. And with that simple fact, I stand here as proof that violence isn't inherent in one's religion or race, and the son does not have to follow the ways of his father. And should we fulfill our obligation to live peacefully and to put in the work needed in order to obtain peace, however difficult that it can sometimes be, that ultimately we will leave this earth a better place for the ones we love. Thank you very much. Um, once again, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, as someone who I grew up with Islam and then um, decided at 13 I realized that I was gay and I thought that the two wouldn't be compatible. And I know that I think now my views kind of changed on that. But I know that when I was 13 there was also a sense of loss for the sense of community that I lost because I think, especially in the Muslim community, everyone is so close and Friday prayers and you are really truly together. And when I left that, it felt really isolating. And you said, you said you got a degree in isolation. I think I've just done my PhD. Um, and I think that, I think that would played such a big part of it in terms of connecting to ethno religious identities. And how did you come to terms with that sense of grief over community? You know, I searched for it in other places. Um, I still feel a sense of loss from the community. Um, you know, there have been times where I've, I've gone to a mosque and I've just went and, and I've made prayer, um, you know, just to go through the motions because it was something that was so fundamentally a part of my upbringing and, and it is a, uh, you know, that sense of community. I still feel that loss. And, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I was a Quaker for a time. I, I went to Quaker meeting and, and I found that extremely helpful, um, you know, in, in, in our particular, um, Quaker Meeting House, as many do, there is no leader. Everyone sits down silently. If you are compelled to share what is going through your mind, you stand up, you share. If not, you stay silent. Um, but I, I searched for a sense of community in other places. And, um, and although I still miss you know, that, um, you know, I found it in other spheres. You know, it's not the only place for you. So, you know, I, and you're still, you know, so young. And, and I don't mean that in a detrimental way. I mean that 10 years from now, you will almost certainly be nothing like you are today. Um, so much of what you feel and see will be completely different. And, uh, and you won't believe, you know, the things that you feel that are important today, you won't believe how, you know, how utterly unimportant those things will be. Um, you know, give yourself time. You know, it doesn't have to happen overnight. Us in the back. Um, thank you for being so vulnerable with us today and please feel free not to answer this question if you're not comfortable. Um, but what I want to ask is how do you reconcile the man your father was to the rest of the world as to 
the person he was only behind closed doors that you got to see. Obviously, you know, emotions in families can be quite complex, especially in your situation. So how did you cope having both positive and negative feelings toward this man, considering everything he had done? Um, you know, I think the answer is kind of in the way you framed it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that people can be both full of love and full of hatred at the same time, that we, we as humans have the capacity to hold both of those feelings simultaneously for two completely different groups of people. I knew that my father loved me. I knew that he loved our family and that he cared about us. Um, now, don't get me wrong, him essentially abandoning us. Um, and, you know, as I said during my speech, he was initially found not guilty of the murder. Uh, he was sentenced to 7 to 21 years in prison on assault and weapons charges. And it was his involvement with this group of men and the plot to bomb the World Trade Center as well as these other landmarks that ensured that he would never get out of prison again. So in a sense, it felt like he abandoned us twice. Um, you know, there was this opportunity for us to be a family again. And for years before his involvement in the World Trade Center, he maintained his innocence. And we believed him because he was not, he was found not guilty. And, um, you know, the reality of it is, you know, as I said, people can hold both of those feelings in their hearts at the exact same time. Um, you know, that is the capacity in which we as human beings exist. Sure. Uh, let me just get that person in the back. Yes, please. Um, uh, first of all, I just really want to say thank you for showing me that there's strength in vulnerability. Um, I just wanted to share with you something that, um, well, my parents are both Hindu, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm an atheist, and for two and a half years, I actually um, dated a Muslim, and I had to keep it a secret. Um, and then when they found out, um, my parents like would, they were furious. They threatened to break my legs, and they threatened to disown me. Um, all the way until my high school teacher offered me to live with her. But yeah, um, that's funny. Um, Thank you for sharing. For, so then um, it took a toll on my mental health for about five months. Um, but how, I just wanted to know, how do you go about changing an entire generation of thoughts? You know, I, I wish there was an easy answer, I, you know, I really do, and, and I spent so much time, you know, trying to find the answer to that question, and, um, you know, the best I can do is, 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 is really, it, it takes a sustained effort over time to rid yourself of those perspectives. Um, you know, it's just not an easy thing to do. We we assume that our, our parents or the, you know, our guardians have our best interests at heart and what they teach us is true. And, and you know, being forced to, to reject the foundation of your morality or, or you know, your understanding of the world at the age that you're at um, is, you know, is something that you are going to deal with for you know, a while. And, and, you know, that's okay. It really is. You know, it, you shouldn't accept fundamental truths overnight. It shouldn't be that easy. You, sh you know, I mean, it should take time for those kinds of things to change. And it's, it's not going to be easy. Uh, you know, and it, everyone's experience is different. I, I don't want to assume that everyone's going to react the exact same way that I will. Maybe some people can change quickly. Um, you know, but, but really, you have to be patient with yourself. You have to be kind with yourself. Um, as long as you acknowledge, you know, that, that, that the, the effort um, is there, that, that, that you are doing it for reasons beyond, um, that you are doing it for reasons beyond, you know, frankly, even just yourself. Um, you, you have to allow yourself to be patient with yourself and to love yourself um, and, and to accept that, you know, the struggle is, 
something that makes you unique. It is something that, um, frankly, you know, your c courage to allow yourself to be vulnerable here, um, I'm sure resonates with many other people here. Um, you know, you are not alone in the feelings that you have. Um, you know, just hold on to that and, and um, you know, seek out others who have been through similar experiences and, and even those who haven't. I mean, we may not all have the same experiences, but fundamentally, um, we feel the same emotion. And that is sometimes enough to, to feel a connection with someone. Thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, so I was just going to say, so I think um, Islamophobia now is um, a prominent issue facing the Muslim community. And I feel like that's more with like the media depiction of, of, of Muslims. And I really enjoyed um, how you basically explained the different meanings of jihad. Because like, I think, so um, how you explained that it's not necessarily going to war, but how you basically act um, in your household or there's also going to school and there's different interpretations and different knowledge that I think should be shared. And so besides terminology, is there any other um, so th things that the Islamic community and also non-Muslims can do to basically help fight Islamophobia and just to start breaking down um, like what's false, what's falsified information and what's actually from the Quran? So, yep, that's my question. Well, I, I think, um, well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to tell anyone what I think the Muslim community should do. Um, you know, I, I'm not a member of the Muslim community. I, I, you know, I, although I was raised in the religion of Islam and I was Muslim for still most of my life, um, you know, I, I, that experience, especially in the last, you know, f uh, 15, 16 years that I've been an atheist, um, has changed fundamentally around the globe. But what I would say is, um, you know, how important interaction is. Uh, you know, when a, when a group like ISIS uh, attacks a Western city, they are not, or a Western country, they are not doing it because they believe themselves to be an existential threat to that government. Their role is not to overthrow that government. Their role is to sow division in society. It is to create barriers between people to make us fearful of the skin color of, of the person next to us, to the length of someone's beard, to the sound of a person's name. It is to create isolation, to create an environment that allows them to recruit more members. So understanding the reasons that these attacks take place and what their intention is should have us you know, be less reactionary, to, to not react to a violent attack by wanting to perpetuate that violence, but rather by trying to break down those barriers that separate us, to create avenues for communication. Um, my, my business partner and I, Sharon Matson, we, we began a nonprofit, and, and we are in the process of developing several programs, but one of them is specifically focused on creating avenues of communication between different communities who may not have the opportunity to interact with one another. So understanding that in the wake of these sorts of violent attacks that our effort to communicate with each other has to be increased. Um, you know, and, and just interaction in general, I think is the, the easiest and simplest way when you humanize the other, it is impossible to, to push them into a box. Yes. Thank you again, Zach, for your very wonderful story. I was very inspired by hearing how it all um, transpired. And what I want to ask is, I'm sure that everyone else here is very, also very uh, inspired by how you managed to change one of your um, worst, uh, worst moments in history into one of your uh, purpose in life. And what I want to ask is, do you have any tips here as well to people who are and uh, how people can turn their worst moments in their life as well into a sense of purpose in their life, because I think that having a purpose such as that can really drive a lot of people as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a wonderful question. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that I have the full answer to that question. I, I feel in some ways that um, the way this all worked out just kind of really benefited me. I mean, um, I get to, every day, it is my job to interact with people who want to make the world a better place. 
I mean, how many people can say that? It is so easy to get bogged down in the horrible things that are happening all the time. But I have, as an occupation, um, the opportunity to interact every day with people who, you know, who necessarily haven't been through um, traumatic events and yet are still motivated to try to make the world a better place. That in and of itself is, is you know, really helpful to me, um, that reminder. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not 100% I'm not sure that I have the answer to that question. You know, there are so many things that I even still to this day, as I'm going through them, I'm still trying to, to fully understand, you know, just for myself. I think, you know, as I've said before, it requires a patience um, in yourself, of yourself, uh, to allow yourself the time to get where you need to be. Yes. Thank you very much for being here today. Not many have the courage to really stand on the stage and talk about these topics. Mm -hmm. And my question for you would be, can you describe how your life's goals and purpose have changed from the time when you were very young and then growing up seeing what your father has done up to now? Thank you. Um, you know, when I was young, I, I don't know that I had goals. Um, you know, my father went to prison when I was seven. My life was, I've moved 30, I think 33 times since I was born. I'd moved 20 times by the time I was 19. I, I didn't have time to think about my future. Uh, you know, I was one of those kids that could never see their life past a year in the future. Um, you know, there just, there was no stability in my life. Um, it really wasn't until I was a, a full-grown adult that I tried to start creating goals for myself. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm certain I'm not the best person here. I, I'm sure many of you uh, would be much better off at, you know, explaining how to set goals and, and um, you know, uh, how to create a better foundation for, for your future. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but. <laughs> yes. I'm uh, from the Jewish religion, you know, I'm from Israel. And I never thought that I would like to, to live my religion because I discover a lot of beautiful uh, things through this religion. And I discovered that it would be a very powerful, powerful and peaceful uh, agenda for tolerance. And I know the, the Islamic religion from my studies, and um, I know that this religion is full of peaceful agenda and tolerance. Um, like Irham Turham, like Ana Fidini wa Anta Fidinuka, and all kinds of such uh, quotes. And I ask, why didn't you deal with the obstacles and the challenges in, within the Islam's with the, within the Islam religion and find it a way to inspire. Through Islam. Um, yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is, you know, uh, I think that it's wonderful that your experience was, um, was one that, that taught you that religion is, is um, you know, something that can be used to spread tolerance. And, and certainly there are many examples um, you know, heroes of mine who use religion to spread tolerance. Um, that was, you know, that wasn't my experience. Um, I saw, in the way that I was raised, I saw um, religion used as a weapon to hurt people. Um, you know, I'm not sure I have the time to get into the, the reasons that I left uh, religion in general, but I would just say that um, 
I began f with the fundamental concept. So, a man is walking down the street, and or you know, a person is walking down the street. Another person says, "I believe in God," and the other person says, "I don't believe you." I've yet to hear a compelling argument, you know, to uh, to um, to override that belief. Um, you know, that that that's me. That's just me personally. Um, you know, I consider myself to be an interfaith atheist. I, I, um, I realize that the vast majority of people in the world do believe in a higher power, um, that the, the problems that plague us as, uh, as, a, as a society cannot be solved by, uh, you, know, um, you know, by people who don't believe in religion. Um, I, I've made it one of my life's goals to work with leaders of religious communities, you know, to, to create avenues of communication between evangelical Christians in Texas and, um, you know, Muslim refugees in, um, you know, in Michigan. Um, the best answer I can give you is that it, to do that, I wouldn't have been true to myself. I, I had a, a, a rabbi come up to me once and tell me that, you know, you would be much more effective in the messaging that you gave if you pretended to be Muslim. And... Um, I wouldn't be here if I, if I wasn't true to myself, if I wasn't true to what I believe, um, you know? So, yeah, I, I don't, um, I, I didn't see uh, a reason to hold on to it. For me, for my experiences, it was something that was a detriment. I can perfectly understand why other people would have completely different ideas and feelings about it. But for me, for my personal experience, it was not something that, um, <clears throat> that was used in my sphere to spread tolerance. Uh, it was often an inhibitor to that. Um, you know, having said that, I, I think that, I, I see you encroaching, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, having said that, I, I think that, that for me, religion is, um, and I mean this in the most sincere and kindest way, is a human creation in the same way that all art is, um, you know, is perceived. Uh, you know, religion is art to me. I'm not sure that there is anything um, more emotionally profound or can be a, a more emotional experience than religion. And, and what, is, what is art if not, um, for, if not something that moves us? So I, I see a great deal of benefit in, in having, you know, belief. But for me, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, it didn't benefit me. It wasn't something that um, made me uh, feel better connected to the world. Um, it, you know, for me, again, it was, it was an inhibitor to my being able to connect to other people. I, I just didn't see, um, see a reason to, to hold on to that. And I, I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't pretend to believe something I didn't, um, even if it meant frankly, being more efficient in the work that I did. Uh, I think that's the last question. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.